This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. You know, I love this whole principle in the Bible of sowing and reaping. I hope this comes across right, but I feel that it gives me a certain measure of control over my life. Well, thank you for being with me today on Enjoying Everyday Life. All this week, I've been teaching about the Beatitudes, or what is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. And they're really about different character traits that Jesus talks about, that if we have those character traits, we will be blessed. Well, what does it mean to be blessed? Well, of course, it's a wonderful word that carries a lot of great meanings, but I looked it up this morning, and in, in the Greek, one of the things it means is to be made large, and that's not talking about us being made large, thankfully. It's talking about living a large life. And I think we all want that. We all want our lives to be big lives. We want to be blessed in big ways. We want to do big things. And it also means to be happy. And I think when you get right down to it, what does anybody want except to be happy? I mean, I think if you just ask somebody, what do you want? I mean, they might say, I want peace or I want joy, but the bottom line of what everybody wants is they want to be happy and they want to enjoy their life. And today we're going to talk about the beatitude or the attitude of mercy. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So that's pretty plain. It's saying if we are willing to be merciful to others, then we will receive mercy ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I need a lot of mercy every single day. I need mercy from God, and I need mercy from other people when I slip up and make mistakes that hurts their feelings. And we want to be generous in giving mercy to other people. Don't be a, a harsh, hard-hearted, bitter person that won't forgive others when they make mistakes. There's actually a really good story that I like in the Bible about a man named Blind Bartimaeus. And it, I'm just going to read it to you. It's in Luke 18, 35 through 43. As he came near to Jericho, it occurred that a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he asked, what does this mean? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Well, he apparently had heard enough about Jesus to know that Jesus was capable of doing miracles, and this man needed a miracle. Perhaps you need a miracle in your life today. And so he shouted, saying, Jesus, son of David, take pity and have mercy on me. But those who were in the front reproved him, telling him, Be quiet. Yet he screamed and shrieked all the more, Son of David, take pity and have mercy on me. And I love the next four words. Then Jesus stood still. I love that, that the cry of a blind beggar sitting on the roadside got the attention of Jesus just because he cried out. Did this man deserve mercy? Was uh, it something he even had a right to expect? You see, mercy is not something we can deserve. It's actually given to those who don't deserve it. And so you need to be bold enough to ask God for mercy because he is a merciful God. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God's mercy is new every day. And I would imagine that we have a fair number of people watching the program right now that you need mercy, and God will give it if you ask for it, but you also have to be willing to receive it. Or perhaps another way of saying it is you need to be merciful to yourself. Now, really, we can't really give ourselves mercy, it has to come from God, but receiving the mercy of God is like giving it to yourself. I had a very difficult time 
being merciful to people in my early years of my walk with God. I read and studied about mercy, and I wanted to be merciful, but the truth was I was a very harsh, hard, legalistic person. And I didn't know why I had such a hard time showing mercy to people. And God finally revealed to me one day that I could not give mercy to others because I was not receiving mercy myself. So I want to ask you, what are you holding against yourself? Something that you did 20 years ago, 10 years ago, a week ago, yesterday? And maybe you've asked God to forgive you, but you haven't received the mercy from God that you need to receive. You're still punishing yourself. You're still holding against yourself the thing that you did. It's very good to remember that you cannot give away what you don't have. You have to receive God's mercy in order to be able to give it. And I, I just remember that when you cry out to God, He will stand still and listen to what you have to say. In Matthew 9, 13, Jesus said, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Well, you see, under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament, when people made mistakes and they committed sins, they had to make sacrifices to make up for those sins. Dead animal sacrifices are, are different types of food offerings. They had, to, they had to do something to give something up for their sin to be forgiven. But you see, under the New Covenant, under the New Testament that was sealed with the blood of Jesus, we no longer have to pay for our sins because Jesus has paid for them, and He was the final, the one and only, complete sacrifice that would ever be needed. So when I sin or when you sin which we do, we don't have to make sacrifices. What we do is admit our sins, confess our sins, ask God to forgive our sins, and to give us mercy, and then the next thing we should do is receive it. There's so many things that God gives us, but we never receive them. And once again, I know in my heart that there are many people watching today and the thing that you need to do, there's, there's something that's been blocking your relationship with God. There's something that's been even blocking your relationship with people and this is it. You need to receive the mercy of God, but remember you can't earn it. You can't deserve it. All you can do is take it as a free gift and then be thankful enough to be willing to then be merciful to other people. God expects us to give away to others what He has given to us. It's so good. When we sin, God wants to give us mercy. He does not want our sacrifices. Well, there's a lot of things that we sacrifice that aren't dead animals or something that we own. For me, when I made mistakes, I would always sacrifice my joy. I felt guilty and condemned, but I also would not allow myself to enjoy anything. It was a type of self-punishment. How do you feel about yourself? Do you punish yourself by feeling bad about yourself? Do you know you're never going to have good relationships with other people if you don't have a good relationship with yourself? You can't even really have a good relationship with Jesus unless you receive His love and you receive His mercy and you can then enter into a loving relationship with Him. In Matthew 10, verse 5, Jesus said, Heal the sick. He had sent the disciples out two by two to go and minister. And He said, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, Drive out demons. Now listen, freely you have received, freely give. That's so wonderful. Everything that we have received is a free gift. We receive God's forgiveness, so God expects us to forgive other people. God helps us. He expects us to help other people. We have received mercy from God. 
He expects us to give mercy to other people. I don't know about you, but I am very disturbed in my spirit by the number of people who are Christians regularly attending church that are angry. They're angry at somebody in their life that they have refused to forgive. They have received mercy from God, but they're refusing to give it to someone else. And I believe that today can be a wonderful day if many of you that are angry right now will be willing to show mercy, to give mercy. Always remember, hurting people hurt people. People don't just get up every day and think, I'm just going to go see how mean I can be today and how many people I can hurt. People in the world are hurting. They're hurting from things that have been done to them. They're hurting from being abused in their childhood. They're hurting from being rejected, abandoned. They're hurting from all the needs in their life that are not being met yet. And it just kind of comes out of them in bad behavior. And instead of us getting mad at everybody every time they don't treat us exactly right or do what we think they should, we could be more merciful and pray for them that God will be able to heal their soul and show them what they need to do to have the life that Jesus died to give them. Freely you have received, freely give. Webster's Dictionary says that mercy is defined as kindness in excess of what may be expected or demanded by fairness. In other words, mercy is not even fair. And so often that phrase will come up, well, that's not fair. Well, it's not fair for me to forgive them after what they did to me. How can it be fair for me to just let them go scot-free and forgive them? Oh, you don't have to be concerned about that. Nobody's going to get off scot-free until they repent and let God heal their soul. When you forgive someone, you do yourself a favor. You're not doing them a favor. Forgive and pray for your enemies. Pray that they might be blessed. And the first thing that God will probably bless them with is some revelation on their own behavior, and maybe they'll see how they need to change. Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I love that. The Message Bible says it this way. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful or full of care for others, you yourselves find yourself cared for. That's kind of a really attractive way to say it. But just back to what Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Luke 16, 36 through 38. Do not judge and you will not, you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you again. You know, I love this whole principle in the Bible of sowing and reaping. I hope this comes across right, but I feel that it gives me a certain measure of control over my life. In other words, there's many things that I can't do anything about, many circumstances in the world I can't do anything about. But there are principles that God puts in place that if we obey those principles, we will get the results that he says that we will get. And he says, if you give and you're generous, then your needs will always be met. If you show mercy to others, then you'll receive mercy when you need it, not only from God, but from other people. So what a, what a cool way to say, I, I can get what I give away. You know, if you're friendly with people, then you can expect people to be friendly with you. If you show people favor, then you can get favor in your life. The Bible says that, well, we call it the golden rule. I don't know what the Bible says it's the golden rule, but it's certainly important. One of the main things that the Bible says, it's the simplest principle, 
but it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Let me ask you a question, and maybe you need to think about it when the program's over. Is there anybody right now in your life that the way you're treating them is not the way you would want them to treat you? Or maybe the way you're talking about them to other people is not the way you would want them to talk about you. Or maybe even just the way you're thinking about them is not the way you would want them to think about you. The Bible says that we're not to judge other people. And that doesn't mean that we don't judge sin. We can clearly see when someone is in sin if their behavior is something that is opposed to what the Word of God says. If somebody tells me a lie, I know that's a sin. If somebody steals something, I know that's a sin. Matter of fact, the closer you get to God, the quicker you recognize sin in your own life and in the lives of other people. So what does it mean not to judge people? It's not talking about not, not seeing when somebody's doing something wrong, but I believe that it means more you can't judge a person's heart. We never know what's in a person's heart. We can see their behavior but we don't really know what is in them or what may have hurt them that caused them to do what they did. And you see, the great thing about having a relationship with God is He not only sees what you do, but He knows why you did it. I had a very rough time in my initial walk with God. I was born again when I was nine years old, but I did not enter into a serious relationship with God until... I was in my 20s and married Dave, and he and I started going to church on a regular basis. He'd been a Christian all of his life, and he asked me if I'd go to church with him, and I wanted to. He didn't have to try to talk me into it. I always wanted a relationship with God. I just did not know how to have one, and so I started learning things, and, and the more I learned, the more I realized that I had some problems in my life. Well, People often would correct me about my behavior or they, uh, maybe if I did become friends with somebody, they might say to me later, man, when I first liked you, met you, I didn't like you at all. Well, that would not make me feel too good. But I realized that God had a different attitude toward me because he understood that I had been abused in my childhood and mistreated and that I had lived in fear all of my life. So a lot of my responses to people and situations were because of the way I was raised. Now, I couldn't let them become an excuse to stay that way, but that was the reason that I was the way I was, and God understood that, so it was very easy for Him to give me mercy. But because we only see people's behavior, we don't see their heart, it's harder for us to give them mercy. Let's start being a lot more merciful. I believe it's a very important thing to be merciful. We reap what we sow. Mercy sees the why behind the what. Mercy sees the heart. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God saw beyond my tough, rough, often mean exterior. And he saw the little girl on the inside that had been hurt that wanted with all of her heart to be right with God and do the right thing. A merciful person has come face to face with the hard facts of their own wretchedness. They know that without God's mercy, they would have been consumed by their sin. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Such a beautiful scripture. Please get this. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail, or His mercy never fails. They are new every morning. Wow. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Amplified Bible says, It is because of the Lord's mercy and loving kindness that we are not consumed. Because His tender compassions fail not. They are new every morning, and abundant is your stability and faithfulness. 
I guess God makes new, new batches of mercy every night after we go to sleep because we used up all the yesterdays and we need to start all over with fresh mercy again. You know, the Bible teaches us in Hebrews 5 that God chooses those to be in ministry <clears throat> who are <clears throat> just normal human beings because they make mistakes and they know what it's like to make mistakes, and they know what it's like to be forgiven by God, and so they have a better ability to understand other people. Hebrews 5, 1 and 2 says, Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters, <clears throat> matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now listen to this. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. Let me ask you a question. If you're angry with somebody right now and you have not been willing to give them mercy, which mercy, an attitude of mercy is really required to forgive someone. If you have not been required, been willing to give them forgiveness, to forgive them, to loose them, to let them go. That's what it means. If you've not been willing to pray for your enemies, but you keep a hard, harsh attitude toward them, is it time for you to make a change? Is it time for you to realize that what God is asking you to forgive those people for is probably very little compared to what he has forgiven you for? God's mercy is new every day. And you know, it's not about them deserving it. It's not about it being fair. It's about being obedient to God. And the only reason why God tells us to forgive people and to give them mercy is because he knows that we're going to be better off if we do that. The world is full of people that are burdened. I mean, heavy hearts and burdened because they're carrying all this anger around on the inside of them. And I believe today is the day to let go and let God be God in your life. You know, some people have the gift of mercy. Romans 12 talks about gifts of the Spirit. And some people have the gift of mercy. And people who have the gift of mercy also have to be guided by wisdom, not just mercy. Because mercy sometimes will make you just want to give everything away. We have an outreach here to people that have need and we found out that sometimes we can't just put the person in charge of that ministry that just has a strong gift of mercy because they'll give the whole store away, so to speak. And we have to use wisdom along with it and make sure that people aren't taking advantage and that they're actually doing their part. For example, if somebody shows up here and says, my gas and electric have been turned off. Can you help me? Well, we find out. You know, are you a believer in Christ? Where do you go to church? Have you, have you asked your church for help? Are you doing your part to look for a job? And then if we discern that it is somebody that we do feel led of the Lord to help, then we don't just hand them a check. We pay the electric bill or we pay the gas bill. We use wisdom and don't just hand them something that we're not sure what they're going to do with it. I love in Proverbs 1, 3, it says, Receive instruction in wise dealing and discipline in wise thoughtfulness. When I talk about being merciful, I'm not talking about letting people walk all over you or take advantage of you or, or use you in ways that they shouldn't. I'm talking about being merciful to them in your attitude of heart but still helping them learning how to deal with their behavior that may be wrong. And you know, we always offer teaching that enhances or adds to, goes along with what we're sharing here on the program. You've had 25 minutes of teaching, and I can tell you it takes a lot more than that to get over a bitter, wrong attitude. You know, the Pharisees were the most religious of all the people, and they were the most hard-hearted. Don't be a hard-hearted, 
hard to get along with, unforgiving religious person. Be someone who has a deep, intimate relationship with God, who knows His mercy, who's experienced His mercy, who's experienced His forgiveness, who also wants to be like Jesus. That should be our goal, to be Christ-like, to be like Jesus and to give, him, to give others what He has given you. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. When you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you have the power to live the life of a believer. Well, thank you for joining me today on Enjoying Everyday Life, where I teach the Word of God every day and I really pray that I'm led by the Holy Spirit in what you need to hear. And also, the good news is, is I get to hear myself, so I learn and grow at the same time you are. I've been doing some teaching on how to be godly in an ungodly world. It's a series that I taught 12 years ago, but I really felt like I needed to get it out and dust it off and preach it again because we are definitely living in the midst of more and more ungodliness all the time, and yet we as believers in Christ, as children of God, are called to be in the world but not of it. Jesus didn't want to take us out of the world. He wanted us to be here and represent Him. He said we are salt and light. You know, the only thing that gets rid of darkness is light, and salt gives flavor to food. So, if you're the salt of the earth, that means that people should look at you and say, hey, you give flavor to everything. You just, the way you live your life just makes everything better. We're ambassadors of God. He's making his appeal to the world through us. So we finished up yesterday talking about compromise and how we have to be so careful about compromise because it's one of the signs of the end times. Satan works incessantly trying to get us to compromise. And today I want to talk to you about pursuing holiness. Wonder how long it's been since you've heard a good sermon on holiness. I hope it hasn't been too long because I hope your pastors and teachers are teaching you what Jesus said about living a holy life, not legalistic but holiness. We are made holy by the blood of Jesus. So every child of God is holy. You say, well, wait a minute. I know a lot of Christians that sure don't act holy. Well, you see, you have a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. And there's a lot of great things that you have in your spirit that Nobody can see yet through your body because you're not surrendering your soul to Jesus. There's Christian Christians and carnal Christians are people that they do believe in Christ. They've accepted him as the only sacrifice for their sin, but they're still living in and walking according to the flesh. And to be honest, that's how we all start out. But we're not supposed to stay where we started out. God will meet you where you're at, but he loves you too much to leave you where he found you. And we're not going to get in trouble when Jesus comes back if we're not perfected yet. Matter of fact, none of us will be. But God does expect us to be making progress. Look at your life and ask yourself, have a meeting with yourself and ask yourself, am I making progress? You know, I don't believe that anybody can be truly born again and see no change whatsoever in their behavior. 
My father did not receive Christ until he was 83, sadly. I'm glad he received him before he died because he died when he was 86. But he was one of the meanest people you would ever want to meet and had an absolutely filthy mouth. I mean, he just, every kind of bad cuss word that anybody could use, I grew up hearing it. And I hate bad language. I just, I hate it. And do you know, after he received Christ as his Savior, I don't think I ever heard the man use a curse word after that. Wow. I saw a change. Now, he didn't have much time to grow as a Christian, but he became much sweeter, much kinder, more thankful. I think if you say you're a Christian and you turned your life over to God and there's no change, then something's wrong. Maybe you need to go back to first base and have a chat with God about some things. But when Jesus comes to live in us through the Holy Spirit, he brings everything with him, like you have the fruit of the Spirit in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. All those things are in you, in your spirit. They're in there in little seed-like form. And if you water them with the Word of God, let the sun of righteousness shine on you, spend time with God, water the seed with the water of the Word, they'll grow, and pretty soon your mind will be renewed, you're going to want what God wants, your will will be changed, and you won't be living by how you feel, you'll be living according to the Word of God. So as soon as that soulish part of you, your mind, your will, and your emotions, begins to come under the leadership of the spirit, of your spirit, then people can begin to see Jesus shine through your body. And that's what they need. You know, we can say my heart's right till the cows come home, but people can't see your heart. God can, but people can't. They can only see your behavior. <laughs> And a couple of days ago, we talked about how important it is to have godly behavior. So we're going to talk about holiness. Hebrews 10, verse 10. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, he said we have been made holy. Well, if you have been, then you are. Three verses down in verse 14, it says something that could be confusing if you don't really understand how this works. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So in verse 10 it says you have been made holy. Now verse 14 says you are being made holy. Well, this is exactly what I'm talking about, about what you have in your spirit the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit because he's holy. <laughs> and so when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, he brings holiness with him. So you're holy. In your spirit, you've been made holy. But yet at the same time, you are being made holy <laughs> through the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in you. It's called sanctification. We are sanctified by the Spirit which means made holy. You see, God has given us righteousness through faith. It's been imputed to us, given to us, but yet we don't do everything right. But we do things a little more right all the time. I'm certainly behaving better than I was five years ago. My gosh, if I look back 40 years, whoa, I'm like a totally different person. Wouldn't even recognize myself. Sometimes you're growing in such little increments that you don't notice it. But if you look back at how you were, I always say, well, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm on my way. Amen. I hope you can all say the same thing. So... We are made holy to be obedient to Jesus Christ. God would never expect you 
to be holy if he had not given you holiness. He would never expect you to act right if he hadn't given you righteousness. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. So we have peace. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. God would never require you to walk in peace in the world if you didn't have any peace in you. You can't give away what you don't have. Oh, I wish everybody understood this. Because so often we go to church and we hear, well, you need to do this, you should do that, you shouldn't do that, and then we go home and we try. But if you don't really know who you are in Christ, you have, that has to be the foundation of everything. Who I am in Christ. What has Jesus done on the inside of me? And when I begin to believe that I have those things that God says I have, even if I'm not acting like it yet, but I begin to believe it, then I will produce what I believe. You become what you believe. 1 Peter 1, 2 says, You have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ, and you've been sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. So, God has predetermined that he wants us to live holy lives. Now, that doesn't mean that it's just going to happen, but that's his will for us. And he doesn't expect us to do it by ourselves. He gave us his Holy Spirit, to come and live with us, to never leave us nor forsake us. And he is our teacher. He teaches us truth. He is our strengthener. He is our helper. He convicts us of sin and convinces us of righteousness. My goodness, what a wonderful ministry the Holy Spirit has in our lives. We should be so thankful for the Holy Spirit. God never asks us to do something without giving us what we need to do it. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you were living in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Now, you know, that scripture used to just scare me because I'd say like what's going be holy and I knew that I was lacking in so many areas of my life but the amplified bible which amplifies some of the original language says in parentheses after be holy for I am holy it says that it's growing in spiritual maturity so we're made holy, but Philippians 2.14 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> well, the Bible already says that we're saved by grace, not by works. So how can, it doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. Same thing I started talking about. You've got it in you. <laughs> you do, you've got it. You have got it. But maybe the world's not seeing it yet. I always say when you're born again, if you're bald, you don't grow hair on your head. You know, when you're born again, if you're overweight, you don't suddenly lose 50 pounds and all of a sudden overnight you're the perfect weight for you. God's there to help us. He's not there to do everything for us. So you set your goal to live a holy life because that's what God wants you to do. Now listen to this. Pursue holiness. Uh-oh. Pursue means to chase after, go after with all you've got. Pursue holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Uh-oh. That's Hebrews 12, 14. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I, I was thinking this morning, but why are peace and holiness put there together? Make every effort to live in peace and pursue holiness. You know why I think 
peace needs to be there because if we're all upset all the time and stirred up and in a turmoil and frustrated, we can't hear from God. I'm not, I'm not going to have any sensitivity in my spirit to know when the Holy Spirit is convicting me, no, Joyce, don't do that, or yes, Joyce, you should do this. So if we want to hear from God, it's very important that we learn how to live in peace. That's one of the reasons why the Bible tells us not to stay angry, don't let the sun go down on your, angry, on, on your anger, and forgive people quickly and fully and completely like God forgives us. Don't be easily offended. We don't need to be upset about all this stuff because the more upset you are, the less you're going to be able to be led by the Holy Spirit. Please understand that. You cannot hear from God if you're in a turmoil all the time. And we need to be able to hear from God. I was watching a movie the other night that was, had a Christian basis to it, and I liked what this girl said. Somebody was saying to her, well, how do you know what's right or wrong? She said, well, if it's right, everything is quiet inside. If it's wrong, I have all these flutters. <laughs> and I thought that was a cute way of putting it. It's like our conscience is a function of our spirit. And your conscience will, you'll have peace if what you're doing is right. And if it's not right, then you won't have peace. And boy, we need to pay attention to that. Make every effort. There's an effort to be a victorious Christian. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without this holiness, no one will ever see the Lord. Now, let me clarify something before somebody gets upset. This doesn't say that if you haven't arrived at holiness, you won't see the Lord. <laughs> it says if you're not pursuing holiness, you won't see the Lord. And if you love Jesus... Nobody should have to beat you over the head with that sermon. It should be something that's like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I heard that. I want to be obedient to Christ. I love him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. But sometimes people just don't know how to do it. And that's my job as a teacher is explaining some of these things to you like I'm trying to do today, that you've got it in you. Now you work with the Holy Spirit to work what's in you out of you. So you're behaving properly and that behavior can become a witness to people in the world and you can be a salty Christian making them thirsty for what you have. I love it. I just absolutely love it. But what about salvation by grace and not by works? <laughs> Well, the book of Romans states that no man can be made righteous or right with God by works, but only by faith in Christ. So, so what about that? Well, grace justifies the sinner, but it never justifies sin. And that's where a lot of people get all messed up about grace. They think that they can do live any way they want to, and God's grace will cover them. No, no, no. Grace justifies the sinner but it does not justify sin. We're made right with God by the grace of God. We're saved by the grace of God. But then we still work with the Holy Spirit to make an effort by the grace that He continues to give us to live the kind of life that says to people, I am a child of God. I don't want to need a bumper sticker for somebody to know that I'm a Christian. I want them to be able to know that I'm a Christian by the way I treat them and by the way that I behave. And we don't always behave perfectly, but boy, if you mistreat somebody as soon as you get convicted by the Holy Spirit that you did, you should go right back and say, you know what, I, I was wrong in the way I acted. Would you please forgive me? I don't think the world expects us to be perfect, but they do expect us to be real and genuine and honest. Paul said, I don't take the grace of God in vain. We need the grace of God to help us in all of these areas of life. Now, 
You know, this is really very simple. Faith without works is dead. I have faith that Jesus bore my sin. I believe that Jesus took all my sin. He absorbed all of our sin. He took it to the Christ, to the cross, and he killed the power of sin over you there on the cross. He fulfilled the law. He was buried, and three days later he rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God. Fifty days later on the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit, and people were filled with and baptized with the Holy Spirit. And a new power came into them. When you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you have the power to live the life of a believer. Wow. Maybe you can tell I'm just a little bit excited today. James talked about this thing about faith versus works. That's why I say if you have real faith, there, there has to be works. You can't just have real faith and not change. Now, you know, before I started learning the Word of God, to be honest, I could mistreat people and not even know it. But I can't do that now because I've learned so much of the Word and I have the Holy Spirit in me that I know. It doesn't take very long. I know if my behavior is not right. James 2, 14 through 20 says, what good is it, brothers and sisters, if you claim to have faith, but you have no deeds? Can faith alone save you? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and you say to them, well, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, <laughs> but you do nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? You know, we do this a lot. Somebody will tell us they have a need, and we'll say, well, I'll pray for you. Well, God put on my heart a few years back. He said, quit asking me to do things that you can do yourself and just don't want to. Maybe somebody says to you, you know, I'm, I'm really in trouble. I wasn't able to pay my rent this month because my child got sick and blah, blah, blah. You know, genuine, real need there. Galatians 6 says, when opportunity comes to you, do good, especially to those of the household of faith. So you say, well, I'll pray for you. So you pray for God to give them the money to pay their rent. But you've got the money in the bank. You can pay their rent. Ooh, now don't turn the TV off. Well, sometimes we're greedy. We're selfish. We don't want to do it. We'd like for God to do it, but we don't want to do it. In the same way, faith by itself, is not if not accompanied by action, is dead. Galatians 5, 6 says, faith worketh by love. <laughs> love is what gives faith power, knowing that God loves you and letting that love flow through you to other people. Now somebody will say, well, you have faith and I have deeds. You show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. See, I can tell people I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But you know, if you are a Christian... You'll produce Christian fruit, and really you won't even have to tell anybody. You know, an orange tree doesn't, or a peach tree or whatever, doesn't shout, I'm a peach tree, I'm a peach tree. I, I know it's a peach tree, it's got peaches. I know what a banana tree is because it has bananas. And if you have godly Christian fruit, people will know that you're a child of God because of your behavior. Faith without works is dead. You foolish person, he says. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Now, the Bible tells us to stay away from works of the flesh, which is our energy trying to do God's job. But there's a difference in works of the flesh and the work of God. Jesus said... I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And I love that. I want to finish the work that God gave me to do, but 
I don't, I don't want to live my life by my energy trying to do what only God can do. William Law, who's already been dead for quite a while, he wrote some powerful stuff on holiness. Uh, a serious call to a devout and a holy life, William Law said, Assurance to us that he will be merciful to our unavoidable weaknesses and infirmities, that is, to such failings as are the effects of ignorance or surprise. Yet we have no reason to expect the same mercy toward those sins which we have lived in through a lack of intention to avoid them. Boy, I like that. <laughs> he said, look, if you're ignorant, you don't know any better, God's going to give you, but if you know better and you just keep doing it anyway, now that's a different story. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. I don't think anybody should ever have to ask us if we're a Christian. I think they should not be around us more than five or ten minutes and they'll know. I want to talk to you about how to be godly in an ungodly world. The line is getting very blurry between who is a believer and who isn't. Amen? Yeah. And what I mean by that is, you know, just because somebody's got a bumper sticker on their car, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're walking with God the way that they should or that they're not compromising in their life behind the scenes. And I really believe that if we're going to put bumper stickers on our car and hang Christian jewelry around our neck and carry Bibles and do things that make us look like we're Christians, then I think we ought to live the life. Otherwise, I think we need to just take them off. And uh, it's, it's actually getting extremely concerning, the the Bible says that in the last days, which I don't know how much longer it's going to be before Jesus is going to come back, but one thing's for sure, a lot of the signs that the Bible talks about are definitely being fulfilled today. And so we have to realize that if God chose us to live in this time frame, now hear me. You're not just kind of born accidentally and put into some time frame somewhere in the world. You, you're, God puts you in a place, in a time frame, for a reason. And if you're here in this time frame, at this time in world history, then you've got a job to do. It's not all up to the people standing up here. Matter of fact, most of the people who need help are not going to come in here. They're going to be out there where you're at. And so our job is to train you up that you might go out and do the work of the ministry. I'm going to say that again. The five-fold ministry is called to train you up that you might go out and do the work of the ministry. And... This is not a time to just come to church and admire the person on the platform. This is a time to get everything you possibly can and make sure that you're ready to take what you hear and go out in the world and use it. Amen? In Matthew 24, there's signs of the end times. And one of the things it says is that deception is going to be great. Matter of fact, it's going to be so great 
that if God did not shorten the days for the sake of the very elect, that no man could stand the deception that's coming on the world. Do you pray on even a semi-regular basis that God will protect you from deception that you will not be deceived? Do you pray that? If you don't pray that, I want to encourage you to pray that every day because to think that you can't be deceived is deception itself. Amen? I'm going to tell you a couple stories that will hopefully get my point across. I know a man who, whose wife decided that she wants a divorce, and so he knows another man who was getting a divorce, and this man has an apartment, and he had a lease on the apartment, but he didn't really want to keep the apartment because even though he's still married to his wife, he's living with his girlfriend, so he wanted to sublease his apartment. <laughs> uh, you're laughing, you haven't even heard the crazy part yet. <laughs> and, but it's good to hear somebody laugh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so he suggests to my friend, <laughs> I'm still going, he suggests to my friend that they fast one day a week for one of the fruit of the Spirit. You're not getting it. <laughs> He's married. He's living with his girlfriend. And he thinks they should fast one day a week <laughs> for the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> I'm like, have you lost your mind? God says he wants obedience, not sacrifice. Amen? And I think, I do think a lot of times people don't do what God tells them to do, but then they'll do some other religious work to try to make up for the thing that God told them to do that they didn't do. Isaiah talked about this in Isaiah 58. The people said, why have we fasted and you haven't seen it? <laughs> why have you not noticed our fasting? And God comes back and says, well, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. <laughs> you mistreat your workers. You quarrel and you have strife and you mistreat one another. So he's basically saying there that if your behavior is going to be ungodly, <laughs> then forget the fasting. Now, I'm not talking to any of you, this is just <laughs> for your pathetically compromising friends. Not for you. But, but just in case you would get tempted, I really want everybody to take this to heart tonight because there is such a pull out in the world to pull people into that gray area, that blurry area I don't think anybody should ever have to ask us if we're a Christian. I think they should not be around us more than five or 10 minutes and they'll know. And not because, not because we're preaching to them and not because we've got on a certain kind of jewelry or we've got a bumper sticker on our car, but there should be something about us, which of course is Jesus and the Holy Spirit on our lives that comes through our behavior, there's nothing more important than how we behave. It's more important than how often you go to church. It's more important than how often you fast. 
It's more important than how much of the Bible you've got underlined. Come on, we get our Bibles out, and I've been using this one a couple of years, so it's, it's really marked up good. Yeah. Stars and underlines and yellow and pink and oh my goodness. And we can look at that sometimes and think we are so spiritual. <laughs> or sometimes the pastor has opened to such and such, and boy, if we've got that underlined. <laughs> Come on, you know, that there's a little puff in the flesh. It's like, and we kind of scoot it over a little bit and hope the person next to us <laughs> sees how much we know. But you know what? We don't know anything unless we're doing it. We don't know anything unless we're doing it. And I'd like to even add it's not even are we doing it in front of our Christian friends at church on Sunday. You could probably cross that one off too. It's, are we doing it behind closed doors at home? Come on. See, I learned a long time ago that God sees everything I do. And the thing that is very important to me is that I live my life before God and that I want my reputation with him to be good and that my reputation with him is much more important than my reputation with people. See, sometimes we can do what's right if the right person's watching us that we want to impress, but what do we do when nobody is watching? Hmm. Well, anyway. <laughs> Another story. A girl called our offices. This has been probably a year ago. Sweet. Sweet, sounded like a young girl. She maybe ain't. Hadn't even been saved that long, and at least I hope she hadn't been, because that would make it even worse. <laughs> and I'm kind of hoping that she didn't even go to a church, because if she did, it had to be a really bad one. Because <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> she said, um, some of my friends, my Christian friends, are doing things that are against the law. They're breaking the law, but they're really being blessed. And so they said that God's grace is covering. <laughs> Telling the honest truth. Is that true? <laughs> she wanted us to tell her if that was true. I mean, now why would you even need to make that phone call? Like I said, I'm believing she was maybe only saved a week and wasn't in a church yet. <laughs> but you know what? If people don't get this kind of stuff from the pulpits, where in the world are they going to get it? They're not going to get it on television. They're not going to get it on the internet. They're not going to get it on the news. They can't be guaranteed they're going to get it from their Christian friends. And I love to encourage people and tell you how much God loves you and how he wants to prosper you. But Paul told Timothy to urge, encourage, warn, and rebuke with his teaching. Not just encourage, but to also warn and rebuke. So, you know, I would have rather come here tonight and just taught some funny message. I've got some really funny stuff. 
I mean, I could have had everybody just rolling in the aisles, but I knew that this was what God wanted me to bring to you tonight because I really want to keep you out of trouble in the future and trouble is coming. It took the devil three chapters in Genesis to deceive Eve. So I wonder, <laughs> after all these years he's had to work, what kind of deception is going on today? The devil is alive and well on planet Earth. Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, our Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And so, he's here. But we have authority over him. But it's not going to do any good to try to cast out devils if you don't even have authority over a sink full of dirty dishes yet. <laughs> you say, huh? <laughs> if you're not even taking care of what belongs to you, and your whole life behind closed doors at home is a mess, your finances are a mess, what you, your car is a mess, everything's a mess. It starts at home. It starts with, with the basic foundation, with getting along with the people in your house. I can't fight with Dave all day and then come up here and preach. Well, I could, but it wouldn't be very anointed. Deception means to believe a lie. If you look it up in the Vines Greek Dictionary, it means to cheat, deceive, beguile, that which gives a false impression, rather by appearance, statement, or influence. It's crafty, it's bait, it's a snare, it's a wandering from the right path. It's when we believe that good is evil and evil is good, that right is wrong and wrong is right. And boy, we got some of that going on in the world. Amen. You know, we don't even really like to call sin, sin. We call it our problem, our mistake, our addiction, our bondage, our weakness, and sometimes even our disease. But we don't like to say we sinned. But that's what God calls it. Oh, did you hear so-and-so fell into adultery? You don't fall into adultery. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you're just walking along and oops, you fall into adultery. I mean, you... There had to be a lot of other stuff that went on before that. And it starts with little stuff. And people that are wise, people who have prayed, God, please don't let me get deceived. I mean, you know the instant that the devil's trying to start something. I had a man at our church one time, a good friend of Dave's. He said to me one night in, in the back of the church, he said, I just wish my wife was as pretty as you are. I went straight and told my husband, and if he would have ever said anything like that to me again, Dave would have went and talked to him. But that's how stuff gets started. Now, like I said, I know this is not for you. So don't, don't get mad at me, I know it's not for you. Isaiah 50, 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I'm not real sure what woe is, but I know I don't want any of it. 
Society today is lacking in integrity. Matter of fact, you can ask a lot of young people, what, what's, what is integrity? What's the definition? They don't even know. They don't even know what it is. Integrity means you say what you're gonna do and you do what you said. It means that you're honest. How many of you have had the wonderful experience of having a repairman scheduled? <laughs> See, you already know where I'm going. You took off work to be there for the appointment. He's supposed to be there at one o'clock. He doesn't come, he doesn't call. Oh, I'm sorry, I just got busy. That kind of stuff goes on all the time. We're at a point in our society where it's very difficult to really depend on people's word. But listen, we have to set the example. That's what I'm saying. We have a job to do. I <laughs> Tonight, I'm calling every one of you into ministry. I mean, into full-time ministry. And I'm charging you with the job of going out in the world and being salt and light. Salt means you've got some flavor to your life. There's something there that somebody wants. I want to be like that. That person's got something I want. If you tell somebody you're gonna call them back, call them back. Oh, I'll call you sometime and we'll have lunch. You don't even like them. You don't intend to have lunch with them. <laughs> it was just something to say. Oh, I'll call, I'll call you sometime and we'll have lunch. <laughs> I usually come here once a year so I can say whatever I want to. <laughs> Do you know how many Christians are mad at somebody else? More than are not. And you may have come here tonight with somebody you're mad at. <laughs> and yet we know full well what the Bible says about forgiveness. Forgiveness, unforgiveness is the biggest door that we give the devil, open door. He gains more ground through unforgiveness than through anything else. We have to get, we have to become experts at forgiving and not being easily offended and touchy. And there's so much of that out in the world. Well, what you said wasn't politically correct and it offended me. <laughs> well, the Bible says don't take offense. Right. It's not just a matter of you offended me. The Bible says don't take offense. Just because somebody tries to give you some doesn't mean you have to take it. <laughs> Amen? Oh, get so good at forgiving that you make the devil so mad he can hardly stand it. God is long-suffering and merciful. He patiently tries to draw people out of sin into his forgiveness and holiness. But the day will come when he will not merely put up with what is taking place in the world. And God will deal with this mess. And we wanna make sure that we are on the right side of it. The side of fighting against it and being an example. I'll tell you what, you can, be, you can preach a sermon and not open your mouth. And you don't have to act weird like you live on some planet called Christian planet. You don't have to be hyper-religious. You can be in the world and not be worldly. You can, you can be friendly with 
unbelievers to a certain point. We can't all stay away from all the unbelievers, otherwise nobody's ever gonna get brought into the kingdom. But you do have to make sure that you're influencing them and they're not infecting you. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. God's purpose is beyond our comprehension when we go through things that are hard. And I know right now some of you are going through some very, very, very hard things and it makes no sense to you and you don't understand and it doesn't seem fair. Trust God and do good. I think that you can make a decision ahead of time before you ever get hurt how you're going to respond. And I think it needs to be part of our walk with God that we're always praying, God, if and when I get hurt, help me respond properly. When somebody offends me, help me not to take the offense. Be ready. Be prepared to forgive. In Habakkuk 3, 16 through 19, it starts out and he says, I heard and my whole inner self trembled. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay and rottenness entered my bones and I trembled in my place because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade and attack us. Habakkuk knew that they were about to be invaded by a great enemy and he knew that there was trouble, trouble, trouble coming and he was, he was shaken and quaking. How many of you know sometimes when you say you've been to the doctor and he calls you and wants you to come in for a consultation as soon as you can, it's like, uh-oh. Man, you can get scared and nervous before you ever get there. Well, look at the decision that Habakkuk made before the enemy ever got there. Though the fig tree does not blossom and there's no fruit on the vine, though the yield of the olive fails and the field produces no food, Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls. In other words, no matter how bad things turn out, I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. Come on. We can make a decision ahead of time that no matter what happens, we're going to rejoice in the Lord. Can I tell you something? You're not going to like it, but I'm going to tell you anyway because it's true. Everything is not always going to turn out the way you would like it to. <laughs> Welcome to real life. This is not a movie. It's not a soap opera. People are mean. They're selfish. They're self-centered. They'll take advantage of you. You'll get hurt. Yet you can make a choice. Amen. You don't have to hate people because they're mean. You can actually have compassion for them and feel sorry for them. And that's really what we're supposed to do. I got to the point with my dad where I felt so bad for him because he never had a life. He didn't get a good start. He wasn't taught properly. And that doesn't mean that what he did was right. It wasn't right and he knew it wasn't right. But he had no life. When he died, there was nobody to go to his funeral. Nobody cared. Nobody missed him. All he had at the end of his life was regrets. Don't waste your life and get to be 90 years old and look back and have nothing but regrets. Have something to look back on that you can be happy about. I will rejoice because the Lord God is my strength and my source of courage, my invincible army. He has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence on my high places. And this is what the Amplified Bible says high places are. Challenge and responsibility. 
Hmm. Don't waste your pain. That's the actual title of my message today. Everybody gets hurt. Everybody wants to be healed. But not everybody is then ready to help somebody else. And I believe that there's a purpose in what happens in our life. I don't think that God is the one that hurts us, but I do think that sometimes he could deliver us sooner than what he does. <laughs> How many of you think he could do that? <laughs> and it gets very confusing sometimes why he doesn't. If you could deliver me now, why are you gonna make me go through this for a year before you do it? Because to be honest, we're just like kids. And you know, sometimes you gotta let kids hurt for a little while, kind of pay the price for what they've done. Why? Because you love them and you want them to learn not to do it again. <laughs> Amen? So, if I have gotten myself into a mess through lack of knowledge or bad choices or disobedience or whatever, sometimes the best thing that God can do for me is not come and just swiftly deliver me from it, but let me learn a good lesson because you always gain experience by the things that you go through. And I want to tell you today that God is looking for people to work in his kingdom, but he wants people with experience. Amen. Amen. You can have five college degrees and not be as valuable as somebody who has no degree but has five or ten years of experience. Well, my life's just been wasted. Well, it doesn't have to be. You know, when Jesus fed the 5,000, there was nothing left but crumbs and little fragments. In John 6, 12, it said, gather up the fragments that nothing be wasted. And I believe that that's what God wants to say over your life today. He wants to gather up all the fragments, take all the little pieces that are left over that you feel like are no good, all this stuff that you feel has been wasted in your life, he wants you to gather it all up and say, here it is, God. If you can do anything with this mess, it's yours. He will take all of those fragmented pieces of your life, and he will make something beautiful out of them, and he will cause you, by his grace, to be able to use what's been pain to you as gain for somebody else. All you have to do is think for just a minute. If you like my teaching, you know why you like it? because I didn't just read a book and get up here and preach. Experience, experience is the difference in dry, dead theology and anointed preaching. Want me to say it again? Experience is the difference in dry, dead theology an anointed preaching and teaching that changes your life when you hear it. That's why two people could preach you the same message, and if one of them just put together a sermon that he got out of a book, it can put you to sleep, and you can hear the same message, same words, by somebody who's lived it and gone through it, and it's on fire, and it cuts right down to your heart and changes your life. And I'll tell you the truth, I just don't try to teach on stuff that I don't know anything about. Somebody said to me recently, I think you should do a, a, a series on Revelation. I said, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> I should not. Why? Because I don't understand it. And I, I know it's important, and I read Revelations because the Bible says you're blessed when you do, but there are a thousand different theories about the end times. And I'll tell you what my theory is, just be ready to go at any time. <laughs> I 
I mean, why do we need to know? I mean, when he's, I mean, Paul thought he was living in the last days. Well, so we all say Jesus is coming back soon. Well, I mean, I know one thing. If he was living in the last days, it's the laster of the last days now. And so I don't know if Jesus will come back in my lifetime, but I'll tell you what I'm happy about. He can come get me tonight and I'm ready to go. And that's the way you want to live. You don't want to live like, boy, I hope I, you know, I want to get one of these Revelation series so I can know when Jesus is coming back so I can hurry up and get ready in case he's coming soon. <laughs> no, honey, we got to live ready, not get ready. <laughs> live ready. Don't be afraid of dying. Be excited to go to heaven. That's when life really starts. And Jesus is coming back soon. And this is no time to be messing around and not doing what God's telling you to do. And if nothing else, we can start here this weekend by forgiving everybody that's ever hurt us and making a decision. I am not going to live my life angry at people who are hurting me and probably don't even know what they're doing. I'm going to do what God says and I'm going to pray for them because I don't want them to go to hell. I want them to be saved and I want them to have a good life. And when you start doing that, the devil better get out of the way because he's done controlling you. We got a little Holy Ghost fire going on in here today. Now I'm in the middle of 20 messages and don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Let your mess become your ministry. You know, I was talking to a girl the other day and boy, her life turned out so much different than what she thought it was going to. I remember her before she got married and looked like she was going to be a, a really good preacher and she worked for us for a while in our prison ministry and she got married and she had a daughter and her first daughter had cerebral palsy and was um, autistic in addition to that. And so she's had, needless to say, a rough go. She had a little boy and they told her he was autistic and she stood against it and said, no, he's not. I'm not having it. And uh, he ended up being okay. But instead of just being bitter and resentful because her life didn't turn out the way that she thought it was going to, she has made it a ministry now to, she's trying to work with as many churches as possible to get them to have a special program a special room and get volunteers who will take care of the special needs kids on Sunday morning so the parents can have that one time a week to sit in church together. Because see, when, when you, like, I don't know what that's like because I've never dealt with that. But she's taking... See, when you, when you take something bad and you, you turn it around and try to do something good with it, then that alleviates a lot of your pain. That doesn't mean that it's still not difficult where days are at. But, you know, I'm using what happened to me to try to help other people because I've seen what God can do in your life if you'll do things his way. The world just sees things so differently and they don't understand that you, you can have a tragedy and come out of it triumphantly, actually better than you were when you went into it. That's the kind of God we serve. Come on, that's the kind of God we serve. He can take a tragedy and turn it into a blessing. See, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, but i tell you one thing I do know, and I believe this. I'm not just preaching. I believe that if we want God's will and we love him, that he will take everything that happens to us and work it out for our good. I believe that. Some of the people that work for me and people that we hang out with, we have a little saying, this is going to end well. This is going to end well. Come on, 
whatever you're going through right now, if you'll do things God's way, it's going to end well. Now, I'm not making any promises to the disobedient, but if you're willing to love God and do what he's telling you to do, come on. And we're talking this weekend about getting better and not bitter, being burnt but not bitter, and that means letting go of all this junk from the past and, and don't, don't offer up an excuse. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how hard it is. I do know how hard it is. God does not anoint us to do easy stuff. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life because we can do, listen to me, we can do whatever God tells us to do because he helps us do it. You can forgive. Okay, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. These are cool scriptures right here. Listen, bless, gratefully, praise, and adored be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now, get a hold of verse 4. Who comforts and encourages us in every trouble so that we will be able to comfort and encourage those who are in any kind of trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. So what's he saying here? He's like, okay, when you're in trouble, you've got the God of all comfort to call on, the God of mercy and comfort. And he's gonna come and comfort you. And yes, he wants you to feel good, but there's a higher purpose. He wants to comfort you he wants to, you've been hurt. He wants to heal you. Now he wants you to go and help somebody else. And he wants you, because you've had that experience of seeing what God will do for you, now, he, now you are licensed and equipped with experience to go and tell somebody else, God can comfort you in this. He can get you through it. And they're going to believe you not because you're convincing them, but because there is an anointing on your life because of what you've been through. When you go through things, you come out with an anointing. Come on, the lady who anointed Jesus' feet, she had to break the bottle. There has to be some crushing done for the anointing oil to come out. If you study how they got that anointing oil, it came from seeds that had to be crushed in order to get to the oil. And sometimes our flesh has to be crushed in order for God to get to the good stuff that's on the inside of us that's really gonna help people. Amen? How many times have we all said to God, this is, gonna, this is killing me? <laughs> and one day I finally realized, you know what, it's actually true. It really is killing me so Christ can live through me. Did you hear me? Oh, I can't stand this. Yeah, you can. If you couldn't, you wouldn't be going through it. Okay, God comforts you, and what does he expect you to do? He expects you to turn around now and comfort somebody else. Come on, God doesn't heal us just so we can sit around and feel good. There's a purpose for you. If there was no purpose for you, you'd already be out of here and in your mansion in heaven. I don't care how young you are or how old you are, God has got a purpose for you. If you're here, God's got a purpose for you. And so instead of just staring at the preacher all the time and waiting for him to do something, you need to find out what God wants you to do and get busy doing it. And it probably won't be a platform ministry and you better pray God that it's not. And let me tell you something. Every single one of you can help somebody. Every one of you can help somebody. Every one of you can put a smile on somebody's face. You can make somebody's life better. And when you do, you get so happy, you don't hardly know what to do with yourself. God's purpose is beyond our comprehension when we go through things that are hard. And I know right now some of you are going through some very, very, very hard things and it makes no sense to you, and you don't understand, and it doesn't seem fair, trust God and do good. You know, 
I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but I began to notice in my life that I would be having a very serious problem and I couldn't help myself. There was nothing, no way, no how that I could do to fix my problem. But while I couldn't fix my problem, God was using me to fix other people's problems. Now that's a bit annoying. <laughs> it's like, okay, why are you letting me help all them and I can't help myself? Well, it's very simple. God doesn't want us helping ourselves. He wants us helping one another. Amen? And so here's the way it works. When I reach out and help you, then God reaches out and helps me. But if I'm reaching in trying to help myself and I have no time for you, then all I end up doing is wasting my time and I never get helped. Are you understanding that? So if you have a problem right now, stop trying to fix yourself. I mean, do what God shows you to do, but be a blessing to somebody else. If we can ever get around to acting like real Christians, I mean, we just need to get down to it. One new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How can we convince the world? Everybody that's a Christian, get out there and love each other. Love your enemies, love your believing brothers and sisters, forgive people that treat you like dirt, bless them, help them when they need help. Joseph was hurt, he received healing, and what did he do? He helped other people. Genesis 50, 18 through 21. Then his brothers went and fell down before him in confession, and they said, behold, we are your servants and your slaves. These are the brothers who had sold him. But Joseph said to them, get this church, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Vengeance is his, not mine. In other words, yes, I'm at a place now where I could get you back, but that's not my place. I have one thing to do, and that's bless you. God will take care of everything else. Hello, I have only one thing to do, and that's bless you, and God will take care of everything else. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Watch the rest of this. In order to bring about this present outcome that many people would be kept safe as they are this day, God had to get him into a position where he would not only be in the position to do it, but he would have enough experience to do it, to manage Pharaoh's household during that famine, and in the process, be able to take care of his own family who had mistreated him. Come on, God is so much smarter than we are. <laughs> you know, Ruth was hurt when her husband died, and her brother-in-law, and when her mother-in-law, Naomi, who was a Jew, and Ruth was a Moabitess, she worshiped. Moab, and so when Naomi decided, well, now that her husband's dead and her two daughter-in-law's husbands are dead, who were her sons, she decided she was going to go back to her own people in Judah, and she encouraged Ruth, a Moabite, to go on back to her home because she said, I'm broke, I'm poor, I have nothing to offer you, I can't take care of you. But Ruth chose the harder path. Do you know how challenging it is to find anybody that will choose the harder path? Moses did that. It says he preferred to, to endure hardship with his brethren than to live as the son of Pharaoh. He walked away from a cushy life in order to do what God wanted him to do and be in a position to help people. Well, Ruth chose to stay with her mother-in-law and they had nothing to eat. She had to glean in the fields in order to even get food to eat. She chose the hard path because she believed it was what God wanted her to do. 
And she said, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Well, she ended up marrying the richest guy in the county and coming into the direct bloodline of Jesus Christ. Not a bad reward, amen. Jesus was hurt. I can say, think it's safe to say he was healed since he was resurrected from the dead. And he became the firstborn among many brethren. Do you realize that Jesus could have gotten out of what he went through when Peter was trying to get his sword out and take care of the people that had come to get Jesus. Jesus said, don't you know that I could call a legion of angels? I don't have to do this. I'm doing it because it's my Father's will. Do you know that if he would not have chosen to suffer and go through what God wanted him to go through, that we would not be here today? You know, God's given me the privilege of helping lots of people in my lifetime. But you know what? Way, way back there, if I would have refused to forgive my dad, I would have lost this whole opportunity. Now, I'm sure God could have raised up somebody else, but I'm grateful for the life that I've had. And I'll tell you what, the good parts are so far beyond the bad parts. Why do we even want to waste time sitting around meditating on all the things we don't have when God is doing so much for us?